For this very special episode, I've tailored the script into three segments. The first is for everyone, whether you've seen this show or not, so no spoiler warnings, you're free to enjoy. Then we will have the first spoiler warning, in which I will just discuss episode one, which is a safety net for those who haven't seen the show, are curious about it, but don't want to ruin the whole thing. Then there will be a second spoiler, which I highly encourage anyone who hasn't seen the show to stop watching and enjoy the full series, and then come back because we're going to go deep into the whole thing. Tengen Tapa Gurren Lagann, translating essentially to heaven-piercing crimson face, is a show about the transformation of the soul. It's about brotherly bonds and finding true love. It's about recognizing when someone else is oppressing you and overcoming those forces at all odds. It's a narrative on modern society and the movements that lead to a collective awakening of the human spirit and rising to overcome our inner deadness and become full of life, love, and burning will. It is about the activation of the human DNA and the intrinsic evolutionary spiral power inherent within each one of our own hearts and how if we work together, there's nothing we can't accomplish. It's a story of deep emotional hardship, the craziest trials and tribulations, and above all else, it's about learning to believe in yourself. Truly, words cannot describe the love that I have for this show. It planted some spiritual seeds within me when I was just in high school that activated several years later during my own spiritual awakening at 19. The show is so meaningful to me that even plant medicine will show me specific scenes or character arcs in ceremony from time to time in order to teach me lessons. And you'll even find references to it in Patch Tarot. As a fair warning, not only is the show amazing, hilarious, and epic as epic can be, it's also wildly sexy. There's no shortage of fan service here. And I genuinely believe that this was done in order to get more young men to watch it and wake up to a higher spiritual wisdom. Gurren Lagann is an expression of the lessons of brotherhood. And along with Full Metal Alchemist, there aren't too many shows like it that hit this mark dead center, straight and true. Gurren Lagann will make you laugh, it will make you cry. And with every episode, except maybe episode four, you'll find yourself loving this show more and more until it's done, bringing out an ending more epic than epic can be. Truly, this show is a force to be reckoned with. You can probably tell I have an affinity for this adventure. And so I am thrilled to present you with this very special episode, Gurren Lagann and the Birth of Odin. Here is our first spoiler warning. If you haven't seen the show, but you wanna get a feel for it, you can keep going. Gurren Lagann begins with Simon the Digger and his brother in spirit, Kamina. The entire concept spirals around the bonds of brotherhood and the connections that we form in life with those that we care about. At the beginning of the story, humans are all living underground, isolated from other pockets of civilization. There's a very strict dogma in the village. There is no surface. And anyone who believes that there's a surface is a foolish fool. And thus, they don't dig up. Because how ridiculous of an idea is that anyways? Right from the start, we have this metaphor for our society and the dogmatic ideologies that exist in the world. In the story, the people all live in darkness. They are convinced that there's no such thing as the surface. Today, the conversations of higher spiritual or heavenly realms, astral dimensions, or similar concepts are often ridiculed, despite a never ending stream of testimonials from individuals who have personally experienced these other planes of conscious awareness. Speaking to Simone and Kamina, they beautifully depict a man in his fullness and a boy in his weakness. Kamina fulfills many roles for Simone supporting him and reminding him that he is meant for something great. Simon, who is a digger, is told by Kamina that his drill is the drill that will pierce the heavens. It's beautiful to see how Kamina's encouragement gives Simon the confidence and motivation he needs to believe in himself. He even says, hey, Simon, don't believe in yourself. Believe in the me that believes in you. So many of us today struggle with confidence and self-worth issues. There are so many introverts we make ourselves lowly and weak and stay in the shadows of the world. And then there are others who are outgoing, confident, and sometimes brash and arrogant, which Kamina definitely is. This is very important because the world needs these kinds of people to pair up. If you are someone who is confident and strong and you see someone who is shying away on the inside from stepping into their inner power, you can be that strength for them. 
and that is such a special thing. In fact, to you who is watching this, if you can't believe in yourself right now, believe in the me who believes in you. The world is waiting for you to shine your light to be the highest expression of who you truly are. What's remarkable here is that Kamina essentially plants the seed within Simon. He sees the light in Simon that even Simon himself doesn't know is there. And by telling him, reminding him, encouraging him over and over, Simon grows as a person to overcome his inner self-deprecation. Now, one of the things that was very motivating here, which gives Kamina his strength, was his father and an experience that he had when he was a child. Much like he did, Kamina's father sought to find the surface and he also was called crazy. But one day he found it and Kamina was with him. He saw the surface with his own eyes. And while he didn't stay there with his father, he knew it was true. When we experience truth, even if the world tells us we're crazy, we know it deep down. This is akin to having a mystical experience in life perhaps seeing a synchronicity or having an out-of-body experience, perhaps psychedelic induced or some kind of mystical experience that proves without a doubt for us that there's something greater than the mundane world we are presented with. Even in the face of scrutiny and ridicule, you keep on believing because you know in your heart that it's real. These scenes depict an awareness of striving for something greater in the face of those who would mock and ridicule, which we all must do if we are to attain to a higher light. Throughout this first episode, Simon discovers a little drill necklace, along with a giant face underground, revealed to be a mini mech that he can ride in. Kamina names it Lagan, which is the representation of the vehicle of our soul, but I won't be able to explain that until much later on. For now, everything changes when suddenly, a large mech falls from the ceiling, illuminating the cavernous village. Along with it comes a very powerful woman named Yoko, who swings in firing a massive rifle. Yoko is a character who throughout the series is revealed to have tremendous depth and stands as an archetype of the divine feminine. She's not a girly girl as so many women are depicted to be. And despite her outfit, she isn't just there for the looks. She is a strong woman fully in her power who can fight off giant mechs single-handedly with nothing but her rifle. And throughout the series, she carries many very human moments with a wide range of emotional depth. Yoko teams up with Simon and Kamina and explains to them that this mech is called a gunman and that she's come from a nearby village. They do battle against the great enemy and from an unknown source of power within Simon, as he overcomes his own fear, Lagan ignites with energy and they blast off into the sky, destroying the enemy gunman and liberating themselves from the cavern and into the surface world, giving us a view that's just so beautiful that it looks like it was designed for a perfect desktop wallpaper. Right, now if you have not seen this show before, this is as much as I want to give you. I hope this is enough to inspire you to watch it because it truly is an incredible show. I'd recommend giving it a go first because you definitely don't want to ruin the surprises that await throughout this series. Now, we're about to enter another spoiler void. Do not pass this point unless you've seen the show already, okay? Okay, see you on the other side, maybe. Was it worth it to wait and watch the full show first? One thing I love about the show is that it wastes no time. In contrast, from the beginning of his journey, it took Goku 575 episodes from landing on the planet Earth to embodying cosmic ultra instinct super consciousness. Naruto took over 700 episodes to become Hokage and Luffy, geez, don't get me started. It's been over 900 episodes and he still hasn't found one piece yet. But Gurren Lagann? 27 episodes. It takes no time at all to go from living underground, suppressed by the entire universe, to the ultimate colossal superconscious mega ultra cosmic Gurren Lagann. I mean, seriously, they do not waste any time. 
Which is important, because not all of us have time to watch 900 episodes of Luffy not finding his treasure. Now, built into the fundamental fabric of this show, the ability to believe in anything makes it possible to do so. Kick logic to the curb and do the impossible. But we can see this practically throughout all of human history. I mean, how many people told the Wright brothers that it was impossible to build a flying machine? How many people told Michael Faraday that he was insane for believing in the electromagnetic field? Yet, these people in history believed in something greater than the limits of what society thought was possible, just like the village chief in Jiha Village. And they created and discovered things that completely changed the world forever. To that end, we also see the wisdom of the ancients coming through. The very mech that Simone finds in episode one is a remnant of an ancient technology known to mankind. Today, we say hogwash. There was no advanced technology so long ago. And yet we have evidence today of ancient civilizations with advanced technology in several ways all over our planet, from Gobekli Tepe to the Baghdad Battery. And this weaves in very well with episode five, as Team Garan falls into the pit of Adai Village and discover that this isolated community believes that gunmen are face gods from the celestial lands. There are so many lessons and allegories from this one episode alone, such as how the dogmatic perspective of the village is used to keep their village from overpopulation due to the lack of food that they have, and how they would essentially kill people by sending them to the surface, except it's all under the guise that they're going to some supreme world. It's curious then why they all wouldn't go there freely with this belief which is very similar to the process of ascension from Cloud Atlas, where the slave women would be killed, all the while believing they are about to ascend. This episode really stands as a lesson to the use of dogma to shroud the truth, and that once conditioned to a certain way of being, especially after generations of these beliefs, some people are simply not ready to hear the truth. When Kamina tries to tell everybody the truth, the people of the village reject it. The episode title, mirroring Kamina's own line, is called, I don't get it not one bit. And I think this mirrors how a lot of people feel when looking at other belief systems and perspectives of the world outside of their own. It takes a gentle mind and compassionate heart to be able to understand that the leader of Adai village knew the truth all along, but he continued the deception because he could see that people were not at a level of consciousness to receive the truth. And there really was no solution because none of them were willing or ready to go and fight the gunmen. Team Garen were forced to leave the village and move on. They were not in Adai to be saviors of anyone, except for those willing and ready to receive it and join them on their journey. Even though it may have felt good to awaken everybody, we must learn for ourselves that we cannot save others, but we must each follow our own path to its completion and let go of others who are on their own path. We cannot take anyone with us except those who are already walking alongside us or choose to join us on our journey. Now throughout the entirety of the series, starting with episode three, there's this principle of combining, brotherly combining. Combining actually seems like a fun idea on the surface, but how does it relate to us in any practical way? It's actually quite simple. The truth is we gain tremendous momentum when we are able to collaborate and work together to make things happen. When we put our heads, our hearts, and our bodies together, things become easier and more possible than ever before. Take spirit science, for example. Team Spirit, the name of which was inspired by Team Garen, is comprised of this ragtag team of people from all around the world. And together we do things that would be impossible for one to do alone. If you think, wow, spirit science is great, go Patchman, just remember that behind spirit science is an entire team of people. Sure, we have a Simone, but we also have our own Yoko, Kitan, Dayaka, and everyone who makes it possible to produce all of the content that we do. In fact, everyone who's enrolled in spirit mysteries is contributing to the spiral energy that allows spirit science to level up and evolve. So if you're in Spirit Mysteries, you are also a part of Team Spirit. This is the power of combining, bringing our energies together to make things happen, to make the impossible possible. Now, moving on, I think episode four is a test to see how many people will react versus respond. This episode was animated differently because it had a different director. It was a bit of an experiment on the part of the producers. And there are people who see it and think, oh, this show went to crap and stop watching. Yet for those who see it through, you get some very deep, heavy hitting stuff immediately in the next episode. And the rest of the show is beautiful and moving all the same. Continuing in these core themes of the show, we have fighting spirit, which is more than just a feeling, but a mysterious power that allows their machines to activate and even increase in power. We see this all the way from episode one, 
when Simon getting fired up creates a surge in Lagan, and this is a continuous thing throughout the show. It even allows Gurren Lagan to temporarily repair itself in the middle of battle. Kamina's attitude here, in the face of everyone telling him he's insane, brings about one of my favorite micro scenes in television history. What the hell? It fixed itself. Fighting spirit! What's especially amazing here is that they weave this into the core of the show at the deepest level. For fighting spirit is a reflection of spiral power, the limitless untapped potential within our spiraling DNA. And this also holds a very practical lesson for all of us. When I was a kid, I played soccer on a team. And I remember a number of times out on the field being exhausted and weak from running so much and playing so hard, but time was running out and we needed a goal. And somewhere within me, I would get fired up. I would get so motivated inside to perform and help our team win that out of nowhere, all of this energy would surge within me. And it was as if I could temporarily repair my systems and provide my body with peak performance. Now, of course, today we can call this adrenaline on a physical level, yes, but it was the burning willpower, this feeling within me that motivated me into that state in the first place. And in many occasions, I would start running or moving faster than I normally would and help the team turn around and get that last minute goal. But the thing here is that the adrenaline wouldn't have kicked in if the motivation was not there. I know that this is not going to be exclusive for me. So the lesson here is that this burning fighting spirit lay dormant within you. It's waiting for you to turn the key of your core drill, activating the motivation to do, do the impossible, see the invisible, bro, bro, fight the power. This motivation is really one of the driving forces of the show. And we see a brilliant unity here between Kamina and Simon, who in their combining form the head and heart of everything they stand for and believe in both literally and figuratively. However, we also see the counter energy to this. What happens when fear takes over? It makes sense that Simon, the one with the most fear, would be seated in the head of Gurren Lagann, representing the ego before and after self-actualization. Simon is forced to learn some difficult lessons, even fatal, when his own fear ends up distracting the team in an epic battle and Team Gurren suffers a fatal blow to the heart, the death of Kamina. Up until this point, Kamina carried this thing almost single-handedly. He was the one who inspired everyone to take control of the gunmen. He was the one who inspired this dream that they could be free and overcome the tyranny imposed upon them. He inspired everyone to believe in themselves against all of the odds and no matter the opposition. And then suddenly he was gone. Overnight, everyone's faith diminished. What's more so, they discouraged Simon from his greatness too. Kamina always said it was Simon who gets them out of a bind. It was Simon whose drill would pierce the heavens. Yet, when Kamina was gone, nobody believed this anymore. Nobody showed faith in Simon. In fact, they treated him like he was nothing, a loser, a wimp. And we must understand that because of Kamina's death, Simon does become a mopey, angry, very emotional little guy. He struggles with the loss of his friend, but yet it's amazing to see how others treat him as a result. Because he's not acting like a leader, they cast him aside very quickly, leading to one of the most emotionally challenging three episodes in anime history, at least in my books. It's such a sharp turn for the series, yet it's so incredibly necessary because Gurren Lagann, while on its surface might seem like it's about mech fights and explosions, reveals that it's about so much more than that. Because of this twist, we get to experience deep emotional heartbreak. We get to see Yoko having some extremely human moments and overcoming the loss of the man that she loved. And perhaps most of all, we discover that the show itself is not at all about Kamina. He's not the main character, as much as he was the center up until that point. Truly, the show is about Simon, about the individual who didn't and who couldn't believe in himself due to his own traumas in life, like losing his parents. The lesson here is that it's about all of our souls, that light within all of us, rising into becoming truly incredible people by embodying the light of who we really are. Yet, as a door closes, a window opens, and we have the introduction of a new character named Nia with a very different kind of energy. She represents the innocence and purity of the world, 
like nature. She is literally like a flower, which you can see by the ways her eyes are drawn. She is also the next step for Simon in his journey of learning to believe in himself. One of my favorite scenes of the show is after his three episodes of trauma, Simon saves the entire team and comes to Nia's rescue and defeats one of the Spiral King's generals. It's so moving, but because it's the first time when Simon fully steps into manhood. My bro is dead. He's gone, but he's right there on my back and here in my heart. He lives on as a part of me. It's a coming of age moment where he reveals that he is not his bro. He is himself. Kamina set the stage for his ascension and Simone will keep moving forward, keep drilling to the heavens and overcome any and all obstacles in his way. He expresses the true quality of his soul and even his entire team watches with amazement of how incredible and beautiful his soul shines. And from then on, they see it too. They see what Kamina saw from the very beginning and they believe in Simon and it fuels all of them to go on and save the world from the tyranny of the Spiral King. So now let's just jump straight there. First, it's worth exploring the name itself. He is the Spiral King, Lord Genome. A genome is a complete set of genes or genetic material present in a cell or organism. So Lord Genome is named as such because he is the overlord of spiral power on the planet, controlling and maintaining that people stay at a low spiral energy while also creating the beastmen to rule over the world and keep people from standing up for themselves. Yet, he reveals that no beastmen will ever be able to stand up to a spiral being who is fully in their power, which also carries a powerful lesson for us. That the spiral power, that burning energy within us, when it's truly awakened, is infinite. In the Spiral King fight, there is so much on the line, but it doesn't seem like Simone himself is enough to defeat Lord Genome who has the same tech as Simon, but a stronger body too. Yet in the final moments of their epic duel, Simon defeats the Spiral King with his own core drill, demonstrating that the power is not within the robots, but within the people flowing through us all. And he explodes Lord Genome, leaving a massive hole and the Spiral King plummets to his death, but not before giving a grave warning that one day the moon shall become hell's messenger and destroy the world when over a million apes populate the world. This is amazing because we get all this way into the series and you think, hmm, well, this would make for a great ending, but we haven't even gotten started yet. Season one ends with the fall of Teppelin, the Spiral King's order, and a new world emerges, a world where humans can live on the surface. The experience of seeing all of these wonderful characters grown up was just amazing to see where the show was going. Although I guess some of them were already grown up. Nevertheless, there's still no stopping the powerful reflections on human consciousness throughout this story. After the seven year jump, we see that the world has taken an entirely different form, reflecting on modern civilization and what happens as greater technological advancement is made available to humans. And we even see some reflections on how people behave in the world today. We see this with the people of Kamina City focused so much upon themselves and their luxuries, taking for granted everything that brought about their liberation and forgetting the struggles of the past from only seven years prior. They have forgotten the courage of Team Daiguren. Even the old Jiha village chief who was horrible to Simon and Kamina now has all this wealth and status saying things like, oh yeah, I raised those boys, ha ha ha. It's such a stark contrast to how things were and a strong reflection of the world how humanity just generally isn't always very heart-centered. They can be, but how quick we are to forget when there is the potential for luxury and wealth. Let this be a reminder for all of us to stay in the heart, as Simone does, no matter what circumstances befall us. Now, what's more interesting is that with no more battles to face, the warriors of Team Guren are forced into becoming political leaders which interestingly is exactly the same thing described by Avatar Airbender in the transition to Korra, another series that we'll one day explore in Hidden Spirituality. The job is especially hard on Simon, who suddenly finds himself having to sign stacks of paperwork, a job that really isn't suited for him at all. Out of all of Team Gurren, the one with the most sense about her is Yoko, who leaves the team to go and become a teacher way off in basically Hawaii, which is a reflection of her following her dreams and passions. Now, the one who is the most suited for leading a civilization 
is also the worst for it, Rasyu, who has a great deal of ego blocks that he has to overcome. He becomes a great leader by the end, no question. But in his position after the seven year jump, there is a lot that he's forgotten about the days of the triumph over the Spiral King and the power of the Spiral in general. Ultimately, it shows that he never fully understood it. Because of this lack of understanding, he is led by fear because of his upbringing in Adai village. So when he learns of the prophecy of the moon from Lord Genome, his fear actively sets his goal on being to control and maintain the population of humanity in order to protect them, but doing so becomes a tyrant in his own right, inflicting rigid control over everyone, forcing people from their caves, even if they didn't want to leave. And then later forces Simon to trial and even sentences him to death. We are shown a lesson here of the power of fear to destroy faith. The people are so quick to blame Simon for making the moon fall. They live in terror of their demise and don't have faith. We also find the lesson that it's far easier to point the finger instead of taking responsibility for ourselves. Not only is everyone ungrateful for the lives they now have thanks to Simon and team Dai Guren, they are instantly to reject him and throw him under the bus for the impending doom to come. Further, we have Rasio being more interested in people's cheers and making the people be satisfied than actually doing the right thing and solving the problem at its core. And a tremendous piece of wisdom is revealed here. When you live in a fear-based mentality, freedom is not an option with that kind of thinking. So Rasio basically says to Simon, you know nothing, Jon Snow, when in fact, he was the one who knew nothing, but acted as if he did. Spiritually speaking, we can look at this whole thing and see the influence of fear on our lives. Rasio actively lives in fear in all of his decisions up until the Ark Gurin returns to the earth when he realizes the true nature of spiral power. Fear causes him to become a rigid tyrant. It causes him to close his heart to his friends. And while fear can be a powerful motivator in life, we must see the results that we create when we act from fear and how it ultimately only leads us down a path of despair. Also a side note, the Ark Gurren is likely a reference to the story of Noah's Ark as the Ark Gurren is a great vessel that Rasio wants to use to help humanity to survive the impending cataclysm that is coming towards them with the moon crashing into the earth. Now, be mindful that there is a difference between fear and caution for Rasio could have acted very similarly, except being more open-hearted, keeping people informed about what he was doing, about how he felt. Instead, by keeping everyone in the dark, he created divisions between the truth, the team and the entire human population. And this is another great lesson for us all to live in truth and to remain open, especially with those we love and trust. It's especially important for political and social leaders in the world today, because by keeping information from the public, we limit others from having the best information to make informed decisions. Now, speaking of uninformed decisions, we also see Gimme playing out a common role that many young people experience growing up, arrogance. Gimme is so proud of his mass produced grapparel machines, talking about how the old gunmen were so outdated and not as good, yet the grapparels are completely ineffective against the Mugan because they were not designed to fight such an enemy. Gimme shows arrogance and ignorance towards Simon before being humbled by the truth and the revelation that he cannot actually take on the Mugan without special weapons and needs Simon's help. Okay, so one very important twist in the show is that when the millionth human is born, Nia is suddenly overtaken by anti-spiral consciousness and serves as a messenger, speaking about the destruction of humanity. The spiral nemesis will bring about the destruction of this universe. We anti-spirals exist to prevent that from happening. Nia for the rest of the season is no longer herself, but mentally enslaved by the anti-spirals who we'll explore shortly. This is a very deep reflection of us in that the divine feminine and the Christ Sophia, the pure hearted feminine Christ consciousness and that which Nia represents has been lost or purged from the world or used for nefarious purposes. Nia disappearing shows us this in a very moving way, which fuels Simon to the show's inevitable conclusion. Now, as the show continues, more of the truth is revealed to us all the way until episode 18, the show is shrouded in mystery. What is spiral power? How does all of this work? Why does it work? Up until now, it hasn't been explained. And then at last, we start getting some answers. We discover that Lord Genome, who we all thought was a villain, was actually protecting humanity to survive all along. Same as Rasyu. Does that information suddenly change your perspective of him? In a way, he is actually benevolent. Perhaps his methods were very cruel. Yes, absolutely. But if not for him and those actions, 
humanity would probably have gone extinct entirely. For all of season one, Viral is one of the main enemies, constantly showing up with the Spiral King's generals to try and subdue the team. However, after the fall of Teppelin and the time skip occurs, we find that he's actually trying to protect humans, giving them the freedom of choice to live underground if they wish, where Rasyu is forcing people to the surface in order to count them. After Simon and Viral are imprisoned together, the once enemies become friends, ultimately leading Viral to pilot the body of Gurren Lagann, calming a seat. When Viral first sits down in that chair, it's such a meaningful moment because it shows the transformation through illumination, wisdom, and love. There is no better pilot than Viral for this final mission in that seat, showing that beastmen and humans, or people of an opposing mentality and consciousness, can work together for the betterment of all. Sometimes it just takes getting to know someone else better. Deep down, we all share a common understanding that brings us all together if we can get to the heart. And what's more, Viral is literally sitting in the heart of the body of Gurren Lagann, a demonstration of his own care, even though he's a beast man. This transformation with Viral was actually prophesied throughout though, in a way that most people might miss. The name of his mech was Enkidu, named after the character from the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh, who is a character who is quite literally a beast man, a wild man who roams out in nature with the lions, tigers, and bears, and the other creatures of the wilderness. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, he transforms into a more normal human after being introduced to them and mating with a woman. So the fact that Viral's mech is named Enkidu indicates that he too, over his story, slowly transforms from a beast-like individual to a more conscious and awakened being. Now, we also discover around this time that the war between the spiral races and the anti-spirals were the secret cause of everything from the beginning. And the anti-spirals represent those who would push down on human evolution and progress, stopping the inherent spiral power within us because they believe in the spiral nemesis, the idea that spiral beings will lead to the destruction of the universe. We see this in the world today the anti-spirals are reflected by the corporations, social systems, and politicians who would seek to slow down evolution and direct the focus into keeping things from changing or in the direction of how they want things to go out of fear of what would happen if humanity was to attain too much power. What's more, the anti-spirals actually represent that part of ourselves which colonizes our desire to grow and evolve by keeping us little. It's like that part of Simon who didn't believe in himself, that was afraid, that would keep himself small. Which means the anti-spiral energy is within us. And as they describe at the end, the anti-spirals are trying to inflict absolute despair to quench the human spirit from wanting to spiral, to grow at all. The anti-spirals are also noticeably interesting because they are literally a different kind of enemy, not physical, but an energy or a particular consciousness imposing control. And so they are animated completely differently to match. Their weapons are entirely animated in 3D, demonstrating that they are more like energy bodies than real bodies. We also see this with the anti-spiral himself, who is animated in 2D because the anti-spirals were once spiral beings, but they've changed their DNA and became a different kind of being. On our home world, we sealed away our bodies and any possibility of evolution. This form is the symbol of our determination. So they are animated with scribbles instead of normally drawn like everyone else. What's more, we even see a fun visualization from the Mugan, which demonstrates what it might look like to move between dimensions and ultimately is a really fun way of visualizing multidimensionality. And I mean, how amazing is it to see the Art Gurren Lagann punch the Mugan so hard that it rips a hole in the space-time continuum? I wonder if we opened up a dimensional portal, might it look similar in real life? And of course, there is the revelation that the moon isn't real, which was probably drawn upon from the conspiratorial source material that suggests that there's something up with the moon and that maybe it was even placed there artificially at some point in history due to a number of curious synchronicities about the moon that stands out and suggests that the moon is not a naturally occurring phenomenon on the planet. Its size and position in alignment with the earth is so precise, such as being a perfect match to the sun to create a perfect solar eclipse it seems like it didn't just appear here so perfectly in an ancient collision so long ago, but rather appears to be carefully calculated and precisely shaped and placed to offer such unique alignments to our planet. Even the great geologist and educator Randall Carlson today offers us the wisdom that the moon is one of the greatest mysteries for all of humanity today. 
and we would do well to take that mystery seriously and not pretend we have all the answers to the secrets of the moon. Now, I don't venture a guess to say the truth about the moon in this particular video, but it's interesting that Gurren Lagann draws upon this and offers this idea that the moon is actually a giant gunman itself, the Cathedral Terra, but which had been repurposed by the anti-spirals to become Hell's messenger, watching over the planet and destroying all of life if the human population or spiral power grew too large. Very interesting material. It is only after this that we are offered an explanation of spiral power, which they do in a brilliant way. That refers to the power of evolution present in us life forms possessing a double helix genetic structure. Hmm? To put it in simple terms, it's fighting spirit. Why didn't you say that in the first place? The spiral power is the infinite helixical spiraling power of our DNA and manifests as fighting spirit. And that love powers the universe and makes the spiral power grow. And it is through the power of love that we can break through the limits that bind us and do the impossible. And speaking to this more, it is lightly explained earlier when Liron is on the Ark Guren. He says, the faster we spin, the faster we break free from the bonds of gravity. We can relate this not just to gravity, but that raising our vibration is breaking free from the bonds and limits of our old life and sets us on a course for a new kind of tomorrow. <laughs> Kinon, what's the matter? Simon, Rossiu sent me an email with the surface restoration plan. There was a message written for me on the last page. Huh? After Rossiu realizes his grave mistake and tries to kill himself, Simon offers the same advice that Kamina gave him all those years ago. Let's see ya grit those teeth! <laughs> Which was followed by words of wisdom and compassion. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we need to have a strong wake up call to snap out of our funk, but that doesn't mean we are inherently bad or wrong. We keep moving forward. This is especially amazing because when they return to Dean Gurren, literally everyone forgives Rasiu as if nothing happened. They treat him as if he was one of their own with compassionate understanding for what he went through and the tough position he was in. Powerful lessons of forgiveness right there. Now, speaking of love, we learn that Simon and Nia have a love that extends beyond time and space. And through Simon's love itself, they can track her to the farthest reaches of the universe and even into other dimensions where she is hidden. It's curious too, the anti-spirals are presiding in their own created dimension between the 11th and 12th dimensions, demonstrating their artificial imposition upon the universe. Finally, seeing the way that the anti-spirals are animated and operate also reveals to us more wisdom that we find within the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. The difference between the curved dimensions and the angled dimensions, that the realms of angles are dangerous, the difference between organic and inorganic. And so the legendary team Dai Guren band together for one final showdown, the final battle against the forces of oppression and head out into space. When they finally meet the anti-spirals, they appear as these very strange elongated ships with many faces. Having lots of faces doesn't make you great. It's a lot more than that. Manly combining isn't like some cheap and tawdry love affair where you're free to just come and go as you please. These ships represent vessels of absolute despair existing purely to inflict torment upon the spiral life forms, with their smaller ships being hands and feet with singular eyes, which speak to the manipulation of heartless beings, forcing others into submission. They do this by pushing the Cathedral Terra into a dense mass of energy that actively drains their spiral power. What we discover here is that they are actually now inside of a giant anti-spiral toroidal field. It is eerily reminiscent of the idea of the Martian synthetic Merkaba from the Spirit Science Human History movie, using natural forms and forces, but artificially for malevolent purposes. At first, their solution to this is just to increase their spiral output, but eventually, Simon gets too tired to keep up with this energy, and they need a new plan. And another piece of hidden wisdom comes from their solution, to destroy the energy field at its core. We see this as a common problem in today's world, as often when we face a challenge, the default response from most people is to treat the symptom instead of going to the core. Yet going to the core, which sometimes is more difficult, has much greater rewards. It is a sad yet very heroic end to Kitan, who surrenders his life for the greater cause, personally flying in to destroy the anti-spiral vortex. Amazingly though, Kitan is not truly dead. It's only his body that dies as later on we seek Kitan and the other comrades who died along in the journey 
in Simone's vision when he becomes trapped in the labyrinth of his mind by the anti-spirals. Yet the lesson here, as Simone describes, is that all of them live on within him. So speaking of that scene, let's jump there. This is one of the final great challenges of Team Dai Guren. Even once free of the anti-spirals field and releasing tremendous spiral power, they are then trapped mentally by the anti-spirals, once again showing the method by which people are controlled in the world today. We are manipulated by our own beliefs, by our ideas about who and what we are, or what the future may hold, and it stops us in our path. The anti-spiral then walks freely around the deck of their ship, trapped in multidimensional space. Yet, it's not over, because the way we free ourselves from this entrapment is to find the truth within. First, we see Simon do this by connecting with the spirit of Kamina. But at first, he is presented with an alternate reality, one where they live under the capital, the fall never happened, and they steal from the beastmen and live off of the riches. However, then we jump to seeing them being caught. And in this version, Kamina falls into submission, begging for forgiveness. Yet, a second Kamina appears to Simon and asks Simon to choose which version he likes. One is the Kamina we all know and love. The other is this one groveling on the ground. This scene presents each of us with a choice. Which reality will we choose? We are creators of our realities, but we are trapped within our minds. We have to be the ones to choose freedom, doing what's hard in order to create massive change in our lives. And we can do this. We can each free ourselves from our entrapment, but it takes recognizing that we have a choice first. Simon delivers a mega punch to the false Kamina and reclaims power over his mind and his heart. In a very emotional scene, he says goodbye to Kamina for the last time, something he didn't get to do the first time that Kamina passed. Simon transforms and whisks himself away back to the anti-spiral fight. We are then shown the same scenes with the other members of Team Dai Guren. What fantasy is playing out inside of everyone's minds, keeping them trapped there? Yoko's story is especially moving, where she too is assisted by Kamina in her mental release. And Viral is revealed to just want a loving family deep down in his heart, providing even more depth to the nature of his being. And then it happens. The entire team Dai Guren warp to Nia just in time and we get quite a few amazing lines. It really is a special moment. Don't underestimate us. We don't care about time or space or multidimensional whatevers. We don't give a damn about any of that. Force your way down a path you choose to take and do it all yourself. Even when trapped by karma's cycle, the dreams we left behind will open the door. Even if the universe stands in our way, our seething blood will determine what will be. We'll break through time and space and defy all who would stop us to grab hold of our path. The tomorrow that we're trying to grab for ourselves is not the tomorrow that you've set out for us. It's the tomorrow that we choose for ourselves, a tomorrow that we choose out of all of the infinite universes. We'll fight our way through. We'll keep fighting and protect the universe. The final battle is just legendary. It's so epic that words cannot even describe it. And if you're a true fan of the show and want to go all the way, you should definitely watch the movie version, which takes it to a whole nother level with each member of the team getting their own galaxy sized gunman. And then they all merge together into a quantum universe, Gurren Lagann. What's amazing is that in this final fight, the anti-spirals decide to fight on equal terms now. They no longer resort to tactics like spiral absorption fields or mind control. And this is another lesson for us that our egos, the force within us that keeps us limited, that inflicts fear and despair, that force is only able to fight you at your own level. It will never be a force greater than that which you can achieve. And so they are not actually able to be even stronger than the spiral beings are when operating from max capacity. When the fight is done, the anti-spiral consciousness is destroyed and the game is over. They're able to return home and receive cheers from the entire universe who witnessed the battle. Free of enslavement, the universe itself may now explore what it means to exist unobstructed by the imposed limits of the anti-spirals. Now, the ending of the full series is something that sometimes gets people a little riled. Simon and Nia get married, and then suddenly, Nia disappears, robbing us of our happily ever after ending that seemed like it was a shoe in at this point. The idea is that Nia's consciousness was created by the anti-spirals and she was no longer able to exist for long after they were destroyed. And to be fair, the movie version did a better job of revealing this ahead of time 
as a method of the anti-spirals trying to inflict despair on Simon during their final fight, because it does come as a bit of a shock for viewers at the end. Yet the lesson here is sound. It is revealed that the story is once more, not about what we think it was. This was Simone's journey, yes, but it wasn't about Simone finding love or courage or anything like that. Rather, it was about Simone becoming his own sovereign being. It was about him finding completion as a human, as a soul, not leaning on nor relying on others to help him lift himself up. Upon the completion of his story, he walks away, not sad nor angry about Nia leaving, but in acceptance of the completion of the journey. He expresses that it's not right to use spiral power to bring back people who have died because they would just get in the way of the new people coming into being. And if you stayed after the credits, we also get our first and only post credit scene in the entire series, where we see Liron and Rasu now as old men, having organized intergalactic councils of spiral life across the universe and a meeting of the greatest of civilizations to discuss the future of spiral life forms and make sure that the spiral nemesis that the anti-spirals were afraid of doesn't come to pass. We also see Simon as a wise hermit, reflecting Odin from Norse mythology. He is now the wise wanderer and even has one of his eyes illuminated with spiral wisdom, another reference to Odin who only had one eye. And so at last, we come to what may be very well the deepest part of this entire show. What everything has been building up to from the very beginning, the birth of cosmic wisdom within man. You see, in Norse mythology, Odin gave many sacrifices in order to attain divine wisdom and to understand the workings of the cosmos. And here we see this reflected within Simon. The idea here is that Simon is ultimately a man who within himself took on the responsibility of breaking through the limitations imposed not just upon him, but the entire universe. At the end of his quest, he becomes a keeper of sacred knowledge, a sage who wanders the world taking care of others planting the seeds of wisdom everywhere that he goes. Even though the child he helps at the end was not ready for this cosmic understanding of the spiral, Simon is still able to impart a simple wisdom to the boy, the virtue and power of being gentle with one's energy and that the lights in the sky are stars and that we are a part of something so much bigger than we know. With that, I guess that's it. But I mean, there's always more though. One of the main theme songs of the show, Rapwakan no Tamashida, teaches us amazing lessons throughout the show. Every time it plays, it teaches us to do the impossible, see the invisible. What you're gonna do is what you wanna do. So just break through the roof and you see the truth. It even has lines telling us to open our third eye and that the revolution ain't never gonna be televised. We cannot expect the mainstream media to cover the awakening of consciousness and the transformation of humanity. We have to be the ones to connect with each other and make it happen ourselves. Bringing this mighty episode to a close, I just have to say, this show has such a special place in my heart. It was such a huge part of my awakening journey in life. And at least to me, it's so much more than just a show. It really is an encoded message for all of us about liberation, truth, and freedom. In terms of getting the archetypes right, Gurren Lagann nails it. So thank you, Gurren Lagann, for being such a moving teacher in my life and the lives of all of those who watch you. And thank you for watching this massive episode of Hidden Spirituality. I hope you enjoyed it thoroughly and may this show and the rest of this series aid in your deepening of wisdom in all aspects of life. If you enjoyed this and you wanna connect deeper, I might suggest exploring the seven day transformation. Using a number of the same wisdom teachings found within the show, we have created a seven day course that helps you to create lasting transformation in your life to live life free of the imposition and limitations upon you. If you connected with this episode or any aspect of spirit science, consider checking this out by using this link here or in the author comments below. Thank you again, be blessed, and I'll see you again for something new very soon.